Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, everyone, very, very warm welcome to our March Fireside Chat. We're really excited today to have uh, David Walala and Isabel from Sitatunga Kitale. I hope I pronounced that correctly, David. Um, in, in Kenya, they're in the west of the country. They are uh, an ecosystem restoration community that is doing two hugely inspiring projects. They're, they're two incredible facets, really, that they're focusing on with restoration. And David and Isabel are going to be telling us a bit more about those um, a little later on. We even have a short video of the Wetland Restoration Initiative to tell you about. And uh, the other one is the Capulet Forest. But David is going to go into detail later on. I just want to start, actually, by... Um, giving you a couple of updates from the global ecosystem restoration communities movement. So bear with me while I open my presentation. So this opportunity is at Camp Altiplano in Spain for people under 30, and it is a brilliant opportunity to um, live off grid and meet other inspired people, learn about ecosystem restoration, and really um, have an opportunity for personal growth as you live on the ground with others, learning how to restore the planet. And of course, um, ecosystem restoration community Camp Altiplano is now in its sixth year. They have so much to teach you, so many lessons they've learned from years and years of, um, of, of restoring the very degraded land there. Um, the great thing is that there's no cost to participate. Um, you'll be accommodated in either the straw bale house or else in the one of the bell tents. <coughs> and you also get a small stipend of 150 euros per month, um, sort of pocket money. So it's a great opportunity for under 30s. Just pop on to erc.earth onto our website and click on the link, uh, the, the, the big tab that says participate and you'll find all the details there. Another upcoming opportunity at Camp Altiplano in Spain from the 2nd to the 8th of June. All the details are here. This is a paid experience. Um, it's a real learning experience. Um, there'll be actual um, learning material combined with physical restoration on the ground, delicious organic meals included, um, an opportunity to learn firsthand about everything that's been happening there, plus also um, downtime for you to enjoy the real majestic sunsets and sunrises at Altiplano and to hear about this, this ERC camp, which has become something um, of a legend. And I said camp because they do still call themselves Camp Altiplano, but um, you'll be, you'll be uh, looked after very well by uh, Sylvia. Um, from from Multiplano and um, her team there will ensure that you just have the most enriching experience and that you leave even more fired up than ever before to take on this great work of our time, as John calls it. I'm going to rush through these just because you can find all of them on our website, but there are some great opportunities for you to volunteer at the ERCs um, across the globe, from uh, Kenya, Sitatuko Kitale, which we're meeting with now, um, to uh, Sino Deval in Brazil, uh, another uh, Kenyan ERC, which is Kurumi River, the Cocobada Foundation in Costa Rica, France, that's Versailles in the La Dordogne area. Um, there are two different opportunities there. So really some great opportunities, which you'll find how to participate on uh, erc.earth. Very simple URL we have now. It used to be ecosystem restoration communities.org, but now we've just simplified it to erc.earth and it's it's so simple to remember. Um, I just wanted to tell you quickly about um a, a, an event that took place last month in February. This was the introduction to ecosystem restoration um practical component to the course that we've been running in partnership with the Soil Food Web School. Um, that's Dr. Lane Eng Soil Food Web School. Uh, we had a great uh, uh, opportunity here for people to learn from Paul, who in the photograph is on the left-hand side, Paul Morris, um, who's an, an ecologist and an educator, and he also heads up um, the ecosystem restoration community in the Yucatan Peninsula um, called um, the, the uh, Earth Connection Center. And he hosted people from all over the world uh, to come and learn how to hands-on put into practice what the students had learned at this introduction to ecosystem restoration online course through us and the Soil Food Web. 
Um, and rumor has it that there is another practical component that's going to be offered next February, following on the success of this year's one. So if you are interested in learning more, the first thing to do is to sign up to the Introduction to Ecosystem Restoration course. You'll find more information on our site under Learn. Once you've started the course, you're automatically eligible to, to participate in this practical component. So there's something to look forward to and you can consider in the next year, um, maybe including in your travel plans, um, this trip to, to Mexico. Quickly wanted to draw your attention to a new blog series, which my colleague Melissa is really enjoying doing. Melissa is studying environmental science and she has a brilliant skill of, of storytelling and has a, a unique way of managing to make stuff that's really sciencey and that can be quite technical, really accessible to, to the rest of us. So the series that we've started is called Earth Restoration in Your Backyard. And it's really for those of us who don't have the the privilege or the opportunity to be physically involved on the land at an ecosystem restoration community or other restoration site. And it gives you uh, tips on, on things that you can do literally uh, where you are. Um, so, you know, start where you are and learn how to do things like improve water retention, which used to be maybe more prevalent for people living in some of the drier climates, but also that, as you many of you will know, is becoming a big issue in Europe even. With, with drought and also learn about things like um, microclimate buffering. And if you ask what on earth is microclimate buffering, head over to our website, click on our latest news, our blogs and, um, and tap right in and um, really enjoy learning about this in a very, as I said, accessible format. I'm really excited to let you know that we have welcomed a new ecosystem restoration community in the last couple of weeks to our mighty movement. And that is uh, Quinta de Vale Lama. And please, all the Portuguese speaking community out there, you'll have to excuse my pronunciation, but I hope I, I got it right. We'll be doing an introduction to them very soon on our social media and in our upcoming newsletter. Um, but um, they're doing amazing work on the ground and um, we really are excited to, to have them on board the movement. So that's Quinta Vale de Lama or something like that. <laughs> Um, then just lastly, I really wanted just to remind you all to help us grow, um, to continue to uh, offer the support uh, to the communities on the ground, to continue to be able to provide them with the resources and tools and expertise and knowledge that they need um, to get trees to them, to get volunteers to them, um, and to help more ecosystem restoration communities join the movement. Um, so that we can expand our ever-growing community and and really become um, more thriving and and more um, in a in a position to inspire people everywhere to take up this work. Um, we need we need help. So I want to encourage you to tell your friends about ecosystem restoration communities. Um, tell them to tell their friends too. Um, there will be a great opportunity at the end of the presentation shortly for you to actually um, make a donation to Sitatala Katunga and we'll be sharing the link with you so if you are moved which I have no doubt you're going to be by the presentation that you are going to hear um, you are certainly uh, um, very welcome to um, make a donation by popping onto their web page on the ERC website and, and supporting them um, financially. Right. Um, before I go further, I really wanted to welcome John D. Liu again. John is joining us in the middle of the night in Beijing, as I mentioned. Um, there's no limit to to what we ask him to do, and he always obliges very willingly. So, um, John, I know you wanted to say a few words, and I'm going to hand the mic over to you now so that you can um, you can you can chat to us. Thank you. <clears throat> I really um, am very excited to see how many people are working around the world and how this movement continues to grow. And I think we generally uh, want to hear as much as possible from our, our presenting group. So I'm not going to say too much right now. I'm going to stay on afterwards uh, for a little while. <laughs> it is early morning, but uh, I think this is more valuable even than sleep, perhaps. So um, it is very important that we understand how, how urgent 
restoration is on a planetary scale and that each of us locally can do a tremendous amount and if we're not then we need to really consider what does this mean so we have to work locally and we also have to work simultaneously on a planetary scale because together we're facing enormous challenges and these challenges are not simply um ecological issues we're seeing a lot of social psychological problems we're seeing violence at the edges and the potential for um, really war so peace is ultimately what we're also working to have we we i i personally as a journalist have seen all over the world that uh, the majority of people are good and but we really need to create an environment in which everyone can be happy and be satisfied and ecological restoration and restoring the human spirit that's what's we need that's what we need to do so we're going to hear something r really great today i think because working beyond the idea of just growing food and caring for people, but really taking care of the wilderness areas and wildlife and wetland areas. This is of such critical importance. So I'm going to be here and stay as long as I possibly can, but I'd like to turn it over to our camp. And so, Kath, could you bring them back and uh, we'll all learn together. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you, John. Welcome all of you to our ERC today and uh, I want to give special thanks to uh, Mr. Dilio for thinking of coming up with this great initiative and giving us an opportunity to share uh, the kind of work we do with the rest of the world. So uh, I feel it's a very special place and um, we really want to appreciate the kind of work the ERC is doing both um, here in Kenya and uh, all over the world. Uh, that would be my opening remark. And uh, before I go into much, uh, I just want to introduce my friend, uh, my colleague here. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm Isabel. I, uh, I assist uh, Mr. Valala for the coming three months. I'm an anthropology student, but I study uh, uh, human nature relationships um, in order to become a climate anthropologist. And uh, yeah, thank you all, uh, everyone for joining uh, the presentation today. Thank you. I also have my other colleagues in the, in the page, but maybe um, you will get to know them better uh, in the next time or as we go ahead. So I want us to go straight to the presentation so that uh, we don't take a lot of time. We want to give Mr. Dilio time to rest. So let's begin. So we are from the Statunga ERC. Uh, which is uh, in Kitale, Kenya. Um, click. Yes, so we are based in Transoya County. That's in Trans uh, Transoya County is in the western part of Kenya. We are a community-based organization, and uh, it means we are from the community. Most of our members, we are membership-based, and uh, the people we work with are mostly from our local community. Uh, we currently do not have like fully employed staff. All of us are volunteers in this course. Uh, our main mission is to foster harmonious coexistence for posterity. So we look at how man and nature can coexist um, harmoniously so that we can have a future, a better future for everyone. Uh, so we exist to build um, capacities and implement best interventions. We also mobilize resources and organizations and partners and communities in order to achieve our goal of uh, conserving the environment and uh, as well as improving the conditions of the people locally here so that we don't only look at the environment we also look at uh, the human nature and societies click <clears throat> so um, as you can see from the map we are based in the western uh, part of the country 
Um, Transoya is one of the 47 counties in, Trans in, in Kenya. Uh, the landmass area of the Transoya is 2,470 kilometers squared. The population is nine, almost a million, and uh, the ratio of male to female is almost uh, like 50-50. Um, uh, we are branded as um, David? the bread basket. Yes. Sorry to, to interrupt. Um, could we please ask everyone to mute their microphones if they haven't already done so? We've got quite a bit of interference coming through from somebody on the line. Okay, so uh, our county is branded as a, a food basket to the country Kenya because we are an agricultural county and uh, we produce uh, food, mostly maize, that is supplied across the country. So um, when you come to Kenya, or to Kitale specifically or Transoya, you expect to meet farmers. And uh, unfortunately, most of the practices uh, have been commercialized and uh, we use... Uh, they are a bit unsustainable for the soil and for nature because we use machinery and chemicals in most of the um, agricultural practices to include uh, we spray our farms, local communities spray their farms to to plow and to weed and also to grow crops, So, uh, which is, has a tremendous effect to the, to the environment. Um, we are blessed with a very crucial resources in uh, Transaya County. Uh, two out of five key water towers in the country are found in Transa County. Uh, so we have the Chirangani Hills water tower and we have the Mount Elgon water tower, which are the key sources of water and rivers uh, in, in Kenya. So uh, we also have River Nzoya, which is the second longest river in Kenya. It begins from Transoya here. And then we have River Kipsaina and others. Uh, Transoya also has a few endangered species of animals. Um, uh, these species are conserved in Mount Elgo National Park. Our county is blessed with two national parks to include Mount Elgo National Park and uh, Saiwa Swamp National Park, which is our area of interest. We also have a private uh, conservancy, which is called Italian Nature Conservancy, whereby they, um, they keep some animals where people can visit and see. Click. Oh, uh, before you click, um, our key point of interest is uh, the two points at the map below. You can see the Chirangani Hills water tower, which is uh, uh, in the far east of the map, whereby we have highlighted this area. That is Chirangani Hills water tower, and specifically where we have uh, cut off like this. This is um, uh, Capulet Forest, and this other one here is Sewasom National Park. They're not far from each other. They are almost um, at the same place. So maybe you can click when you go ahead. Um, so our key, let me introduce you to our Satunga ecosystem. As I mentioned earlier, we have uh, two points of interest uh, as comes Satunga or as the Saptunga ERC. The first one is the Capulet Forest, which is um, far up here, uh, as you can see. It's far east of the, of the county, and um, it's at the border of uh, Transoya and West Pokot here. I hope you see my casa. Here on the north is uh, Kapenguria, West Pokot County, and uh, the far east is uh, El Geomarquet County, and then the, uh, the rest of the land is uh, in Transoya County, whereby we have the local people living there. Um, just to mention a bit, of, uh, the second site is uh, the Wieta wetlands, which is adjacent to Saiwasom National Park. The area you see green in the bracket is Saiwasom National Park. Uh, it's the smallest uh, national park in Kenya. Maybe we shall talk about it later. Um, that we are going to talk about. So maybe click. So let's talk a bit more about Kabul Forest. Uh, Kabul Forest is a government gazetted forest. It was gazetted in uh, 1942 uh, as a national, uh, uh, as, a, as a government forest. And um, it occupies 1,551.4 hectares. 
Uh, it used to be a typical indigenous forest uh, some years back, but uh, we had a little bit of a conflict between uh, some government agency and uh, the community, and trees were destroyed. But uh, that was resolved, and the land was recovered back to the government. And uh, after that, the land is available for rehabilitation uh, since the 1990s. Since that time, we have not had a serious initiative to help recover that particular land into a forest. And um, it has been used as a grazing land. You can see some cows into the field. But now the government is serious. It wants to rehabilitate it. And um, as an, a young environmentalist, I saw an opportunity to help restore this particular land. Of course, I've grown up here. I know the place very well. I know the whole history and uh, how things have been. And it's now time to rehabilitate. So since we showed interest, the government has been serious and uh, has been able to condone the area. From the Raising, um, and it has given handed over to our organization as a site uh, for rehabilitation. In Kenya, we have the law allows the law allows us to adopt a forest. So we applied to adopt this particular forest in uh, 2022. towards the end of the year, and last year, in the moment, what you see on that picture are shrubs, and these shrubs are mostly from uh, invasive sestrum species that completely frustrate the growth, undergrowth, or the growth of any other species in this place. So um, to rehabilitate this place, we need to remove these invasive species and plant trees so that we can regrow the original vegetation that was here. So um, uh, apart from the system species, we have a few scattered trees you can see up there. Those are mostly crotons and uh, African acacia trees. Um, the area also has some streams, as you can see, um, which are almost drying up. We need to see if we can recover it up. We can cover them up. So. That's just to mention about cobalt forest. Uh, we need 1.5 million seedlings to be to recover this particular place and make it an original forest like that. So far, we have had uh, from last early last year, um, we have had uh, okay. The approach that we want to use for this particular. Uh, Forest is uh, we we are, we are using both. We want to use both scientific approach, and we also want to use a community-based approach to make sure that we recover this particular place. And um, what we want to do with the scientific um, approach is we want to collect uh, baseline data um, that we can use as a matrix to monitor um, the progress and evaluate um, our success as well as impact of course a success can be like maybe we didn't have trees and now we have trees but uh, we want to also collect ecological data we want to collect weather data we want to collect all that kind of data that we need in these initial stages so that um, as we grow into planting trees and re restoring the place rehabilitating it we also look into what does it mean to the ecology of this place what is the impact that we are creating so that after like 10 years we can be able to look back and see the impact we have created by the success that we have brought. Uh, Community-based approach is whereby we, we are involved in communities, like you can see up there on the pictures. We plan with local communities. Uh, we work with them to look at the best way possible, see on ways to maintain the trees, and also involve them in all aspects of the project so that we can have a, a sustainable future for that particular forest. So far, uh, with the approach and uh, community-based approach, we have been able to plant uh, 64,000 uh, trees, which we have mostly gotten them from um, uh, some of from the members of the organization, some from um, the community tree nurseries, and some from uh, the Kenya Forest Service, 
and friends of Kabulit Forest. So uh, we are looking forward to get, um, maybe we are keeping on applying for grants, looking for partners so that when we get a good grant, we can accelerate the rate of restoring this particular forest uh, project. So let's go to the next slide, please click. So we are going to the Wieta Wetlands. Wieta Wetlands, um, which is the second project that we are dealing with, or the second site. Um, just to introduce quickly, the Wieta Wetlands is um, uh, it's a wetland that is um, north of Saiwa Swamu National Park. As you can see from this picture, I don't know whether you can see uh, my casa. We have... Um, we have uh, two rivers that supply water into Sewa Swam National Park. As you can remember, I said uh, Sewa Swam National Park is the smallest national park in Kenya, but it's very, very significant in a way. The main river that supplies water into Sewa National Park to keep it as a wetland is the River Kapenguria. And uh, the architects of this particular park, they left a space between, uh, before you reach the park, they'd left a space whereby uh, it was acting as a buffer zone to uh, sieve out all the interference, external interference into the park and um, allow, um, okay, it used to sieve out every other in external interference to the park, but uh, due to uh, human uh, uh, demand for land and the climate change issues, people invaded this particular area and the flood that have made an agricultural place. And so the river has been exposed so much that um, you find the park is now struggling with invasive species to include um, the elephant grass, which is threatening the existence of the park. So uh, just to tell you the significance of the uh, Saiwa Samu National Park and why we should conserve it is, uh, as I said earlier, the smallest uh, uh, but very significant park in Kenya. It has more than 450 uh, species of trees. It has more than 350 species of birds. Uh, it also has a few endangered species uh, to include the uh, gray crowned crane. And it also has the Debraza monkey, which you can see from the picture on the, on the sides. And also it has a rare Statunga antelope, which is um, an aquatic antelope it lives in wetlands and um, it cannot survive without the wetlands. So a threat to these rivers that supply water into this park, they threaten the existence of both um, the, 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 the antelope statunga as well as the uh, gray crowned crane. So it's very, very significant. So um, it's a... Uh, so we, we, what we want to do with this is that we want to recreate um, a babason in the north of the river before it enters the park to be able to sieve out um, all the external interferences, including the ecological interference that is brought into the park during the flooding season. So let me ask, um, uh, I ask, maybe you could, let's click on the next presentation, the next slide, please. Click the next slide. Yes, yeah, so there's a link here. I want to show you a little video of uh, what we are doing with this particular wetland to show you how exactly we are working in this place to recover the place. I grew up in this area and uh, I used to love to come from this area. This area is called Wieta. As we grew up, it used to be a great wetland, a very lushy, marshy area.
this is Kapenguria River, one of the two rivers that make up uh, Saiwa Swamp National Park um, and part of the Saiwa Wetland ecosystem. This place has water and um, due to climate change issues you find that the upper side of our land we don't have water so people come down here to begin clearing the place and to grow vegetable so that they can uh, meet the demand for vegetable and earn an extra income from vegetable with my dad but today yeah, we, we, we ate mm. yeah. 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 So the human uh, nature relations here is not um, very sustainable because as you can see most of the natural trees have been cut down uh, as well as the original vegetation is cleared which means the ecology of this place has changed. You can see like uh, we have this kind of tree which is a uh, eucalyptus tree. Um, we know that this tree takes in so much water, gallons and gallons of water per day, uh, which is not a very good thing. It's not supposed, actually, according to the Eucalyptus Act in Kenya, this tree is not supposed to be found anywhere near the wetland or water source. So it's a tree that is condemned to be next to the wetland. But here, people grow it in the wetlands. So as you see this tree, when you follow this river, all the way up, we have this tree on the wetlands. We need to find a way of conserving this area, returning it to its original shape. The people who designed this park, this Saiwaswab National Park, they were wise enough to leave this space, like 500 meters, 600 meters actually, from here to the main road, from the bridge. They left it as a reserve to protect this park from the external variants. <laughs> But we are trying to say that when we are trying to restore your wetlands, to engage, kama hii activity is going to be a lot of money, we are going to be a bricks of money, we are going to harvest it, we are going to engage, we are going to be a lot of money to restore your wetlands. Our aim to restore this place is to ensure that uh, the park is protected from any other variants that can come from outside and intrusion of biological uh, items such as the elephant grass we are talking about. We are talking to communities, we are talking to young people here, we are talking to women, we are talking to youth and uh, schools nearby here and local leadership to ensure that we work together to be able to conserve this area so that we can be able to protect this park and this river pretty. We are planning to begin doing annual Wieta Day, which is um, a day that we shall be commemorating or celebrating um, the presence of this river and the return of the wetlands. That event should be, will, will, is going to be used to create awareness about um, the human impact to this particular wetland and why the community should live in harmony. Uh, with this particular area so that uh, we can have a prosperity feature for both the park, the river and the human beings here.
God bless you. We are the people. Right, uh, near here is a school that um, is uh, it has flourished in sport. The football champion is in Central Africa, and. Um, we have decided to rebrand the school and use the school to help us carry the message of to conserve this particular river and Saiwaswamu National Park. We usually win because of discipline, putting God first and having enough training at evening sessions. Na tunajua unaweza cheza na environment iko So to appreciate we usually give back to the environment. Usually, to get a game, to win like pesa, to win some amount of money, to have the administration, which is given to the environmental club. This is one of the environmental club. We are the girls, Kunua Miti. So today, the school carries a motto, a vision, and a mission to protect, um, to help us protect this park and create awareness of this particular park and um, at that particular school we have put down a good nursery of trees to include bamboo trees that we want to we are using them to support the community to plan in their farms to help in soil conservation and to restore nature in this particular area um, we want to expand this project especially level of projects we feel like um, part of what we need to do is um, get alternative water sources in uh, people's homes if we can help the community find water source somewhere far away from here we are sure that the community um, and we've already talked to the community they'll be more than willing to move and farm in their farms and leave the wetlands to restore naturally as we add more trees to support the banks of this particular <laughs> So thank you very much for the video. Um, I just want to insist that uh, that's exactly what happens and uh, we are really working with communities. We had a big day of Wiata Day. We planned with the youths of this area and uh, we executed it on, on March 9th, uh, that's last weekend. And um, people are very excited and the community is now charged to completely restore their wetland, take charge of their own wetland, uh, wetlands. Yeah, so um, just as uh, in the forest uh, ecosystem, the cobalt forest, we're also going to use um, the scientific approach to execute this project, uh, as well as the community-based approach. And um, in Wieta, we are using, uh, we are rebranding the school, the girls' school, as you saw, um, to carry the mission and vision of um, re restoring this river. So they're going to be our champions to help us create awareness out there about the existence of Wieta wetlands, because the school is adjacent to where we are working. Uh, in Cabaret Forest, we are also working with St. Anthony Boys. We are going, it's uh, one of the also football stars in East Africa. Uh, it's called, we have a school called St. Anthony Boys, and we are going to work with them to help us carry a message of hope for Cabaret Forest. We have also begun the Wieta, Anya Wieta Resident Day, as you have seen in the, in the, in the film. We, also have, we are also doing educational awareness in schools and in communities. Um, and uh, creating also dialogue, people to discuss more about the, the wetland. Maybe click, click the last, please. Yes, so Asante Sana, that's to say thank you very much for listening to me. And you're welcome 
or karibu sana at Statunga ERC. God bless you. Thank you. I welcome any question now. Thank you so much, David, for preparing that presentation. Th this preservation of these beautiful natural habitats is so, so, so important. I mean, ecosystem restoration is so multifaceted in terms of the effects of what it has, um, apart from that. But you guys are just covering it all. I mean, the livelihoods, the restoration of livelihoods, alternative livelihoods that you, you're providing mm -hmm. for people, getting the community on board, helping the community... Yes not just know about it, but be involved in it. And that's why I love the Wetlands Day that you had this past weekend. Um, yes. and, and when we spoke on Thursday, you were still planning this. And it, it's wonderful to see yes. how many people were there and how well they embraced it. But just yes. the other aspects of, of ecosystem restoration and the positive outcomes around creating these habitats for natural, um, for, all, for all species and for everyone on Earth, um, and yes. for it to be a place that people can enjoy and, and treasure. Um, you spoke about the dual benefits um, for, for the people and for nature. And really, um, I'm just really overwhelmed with how comprehensively you and your team have planned this to make sure that you, you're covering everything. And, of course, getting the police chief involved is always a good thing, too. I saw him sticking a tree yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> really, really very well done. And um, I'm very excited to see how, how this initiative grows and strengthens. Um, so it would be great, actually, to check back with you uh, in a year's time. I'm sure that everyone in the audience will agree to really see how it's evolved and how the continued uptake from the community has has grown. Thank you. Uh, just to say one, one more thing is that uh, uh, the most interesting fact about this is uh, uh, a friend of mine who is here with us on this page and, and I, we grew up here. So we are doing, we grew up here and we are inspired by the National Park and the Cabbage Forest. And we went into school to study environment. So we have come back to give back to our community. That makes it very special for us. And that okay. makes it very personal as well. And it, it, it comes across the, the reason yes. why you're doing this. And it and also came across how the community know you and recognize you and welcome you into their homes. And that that really does underline the importance of community-driven ecosystem yes. restoration. Um, and yeah. I think you guys have nailed it. You really, you've nailed it. So well done. Melissa is, um, she's just posted Seta Tunga Katale as link in the chat. Um, remember when I spoke earlier, I mentioned that if you've been inspired and you cannot not have been inspired by this this presentation and the passion behind this particular initiative um, to really consider if you can, even if it's $5 or euros or $50 or euros or whatever you move to to contribute. Um, I know that, that David and his team will greatly appreciate it and, and put it to really good use on, on the ground. Sure. We we're open for questions, guys. Just fire away. Ask us what you want to know. Ask David what you want to know. Um, I know that John is has is had his hand raised, so I'm going to invite John to um to to kick off the Q and A session. John, please go away. Uh, go go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> There's two things that I would like to ask. Um, I'm wondering. Um, which are the tree species that you're you're focusing on, and are you considering creating your own nursery system or, or working with the communities on nursery systems? I would mention that this was very important in China during the restoration in many areas of the country. And the first step was creation of really, really excellent nurseries. So that's one thing. And the and the second thing is, I believe you met Aude Peron um, at Jane J Jane Fraser's house. Is that correct? Um, yeah. Well, <laughs> if you remember, you you met her at one point when she came. I think. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I met her. I met her briefly uh, yeah. in an event. Yeah. Yes. I hope you'll get back in touch with her because <clears throat> her friend um, runs something called Grassroots Economics. Okay. And the grass, Grassroots Economics is building uh, localized economies yes. that, help, that help the people to really grow their communities. And it allows them to focus on the things that are most important to them. And I think 
when you when mm-hmm. you see that a lot of the degradation is mm-hmm. coming from um, people who are encroaching on the wetlands or who have been running cattle where there was once forest or now vegetables in the in the wetlands that you need to have this uh, alternatives for them alternative economy from the de- degrading actions that they're taking otherwise it'd be very difficult to restore this area so I, I I do hope those things but but first of all um, which which species and are you thinking about making nursery systems okay um just quickly to answer you on that, um, we are mostly planting uh, indigenous trees, indigenous African trees, because uh, uh, one of the conditions we are given uh, when we were, we were adapting the forest by the Kenya Forest Service, which is the government agency in charge of forests in Kenya. Uh, it's very clear that uh, they want the area to return to become an original native uh, forest with indigenous trees. So we are not planting anything uh, anything new that's not native, apart from the bamboo, which we are planting on the riverside, along the rivers inside the, inside the forest. Um, at the wetland also, we are also doing the same. We are planting uh, native species there and the bamboo. And then about the tree nursery, um, when, when we began last year to work on the restoration uh, project, uh, the county government of Transoya uh, saw our effort and they donated uh, nursery tools and equipment. We began a least small nursery, uh, but we have not expanded so much because we have not had any grant or uh, support to, to grow the nursery. So we have a nursery, but it's still very small. We need to grow it into a big nursery. But uh, also working with communities, the local community uh, have different groups that we are working with, and these different groups also have tree nurseries. So to make sure that the community really participate, we were preferring if we could buy trees from the community so that they feel from different nurseries so that we can have a bigger group benefiting from the project and support their livelihood in that uh, form. So we can have our own nursery, but also we will be will feel better if we also support other nurseries to grow, and uh, people feel like there's a benefit in supporting such an initiative. Thank you. Melissa has a question. I'm going to ask Melissa to pop onto the screen and share her question. Yes. Hey, <laughs> nice to see you again. Um, yeah. Thank you for this mm. wonderful presentation. It's been great hearing it um, in full detail. And I had a question uh, about the wetland, um, about the restoration plans. Did What yes. do you have, what 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 will be the first few processes that you'll be going through in order to uh, you, um, start? You see, for now we are, for now we are just like, sensitizing communities and trying to plant uh, trees in their farms. Uh, but uh, what we want to do is uh, we want to do a study. If we got a chance, we could begin by doing a comprehensive study of the area. We want to know the what it exists before even we transform it. So that uh, when we begin transforming the place, the study that we did first will give us a baseline. Yeah, so we would wish to do uh, we need we need to do like three studies. The first one should be an environmental impact assessment. The second one, we, a detailed, uh, uh, what do we call it, uh, ecological study to look at uh, the species which exist on that particular area, uh, both plants and animals. And uh, after that, we also do a socioeconomic study mm. and maybe a rural appraisal so that we completely engage the locals and do what they want, so that uh, we they gain their social, uh, I mean, socioeconomic um, earnings, and uh, as well as we gain on the side of restoration and recovery of the place. So we need to do all the studies, get our documentation right, so that we can keep on put up 
I'm monitoring an evaluation matrix to see how best we can deal with it. Uh, and the second one is maybe to completely engage the community and make sure uh, they buy into the idea so that we move on in the same page with them. Thank you. Thanks. Melissa, does that answer your question? Oh, I have uh, so many more, but we'll be on. Okay, <laughs> we'll come back to you. We'll come no, back to you. <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm going to, I, I just, um, Jane, we're going to come to you in a second because um, Larissa was just before you, but I wanted to thank Jane for sharing in the chat the name of the most common um, trees for wetlands. I don't think I'm going to try and pronounce that, Jane. Um, maybe there's a, a common <laughs> name for lay people like me, but as uh, <laughs> so, 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 aromaticum. Cecidium. Um, it's called Cecidium. Great. <laughs> I still can't wrap my tongue around that one, but <laughs> dying to know the common name for it. Um, Jane, we'll come to you in a second. Larissa, would you like to unmute yourself and and um, share your question with David? Thank you. Um, first is uh, a comment. I want to say thank you for the video. Because uh, to me, it was um, uh, not just showing by demonstrating this combination you're talking about between what I would call technology and um, community culture, r rather than mm -hmm. science and community culture, because, you know, community traditions of growing and doing everything were also a science um, uh, in a different way. It was a knowledge system that you know, was a science in its own way. So I just think of it that way. So the video was just a great demonstration of that marriage. Thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, I'm uh, calling from Toronto, but I'm from South Africa. And I'm very interested in how these projects are rolling out you know, on in different parts of the continent. And um, with your particular one, I want to ask mm -hmm. you how you are um, navigating or thinking about the aspects of protecting your projects from mm -hmm. social unrest and, um, you know, political interference and all those things that might come up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do you have another question or? No, okay. that, that was it. Thanks. Okay. So, um, first of all, thank you very much. Um, I credit the little video from a great friend of mine who is a filmmaker and uh, he comes from Uganda. He's Ugandan. He's called uh, Dennis Onyodi. I think uh, is here and actually um, we want to do more projects on film this is just a, a small portion we are trying to see what we can do with it but uh, we really want to document more about the stories of here like the Cabulet forest is a great story and even the the, the Guieta wetland story is another great story so growing up here I would wish to document uh, uh, the 70s the 80s uh how the forest was and what happened and finally where we are today uh because i've witnessed the uh, forest come down and i've also witnessed the change in the climate like i was telling uh the filmmaker and uh isabel who is here with me the drill down a tremendous job uh, i was telling them that when we grew up we used to plant maize in january and uh, when we close schools in april we could come back to weed it was common that was known we close school you come and weed but today we plant in april when we should be weeding and we harvest by october when we are supposed to harvest by december so there's a lot which has changed it needs to be all documented so it's an area that we need to see if we can explore to film and get these stories come out so thank you very much dennis i don't know whether you're here or not and melissa and um melissa has been a uh, uh, Melissa has been an inspiration. She has been telling me to document things. And uh, we have Isabel, who was also a great part of this. Thank you very much. Uh, so far, so good. I've not had um, 
um, a lot of political interference uh, with my project because I'm in good terms with the government and I'm involving them in whatever I do. But my strongest partner, as I can say, has been the community. Uh, like the Uyeta day we did, you saw we had a band that played live music and people danced, we had poems, we had the exact stories of the past about the wetland and so on. And um, people brought tents, the community itself mobilized itself just by my leadership. They brought tents, they brought chairs, and they brought everything. Whatever you saw there was donated by the community. The county government just came in to give us maybe water and a few, a few extra things, which um, is something that has not happened in my community before. So it's the first time it's happening. So I'm in good terms with the government. We are trying to keep uh, as transparent as possible. Once we are set, maybe we get some kind of support. We want to constitute a team that we shall have government entity. Uh, we shall also have the community uh, entity, all the key stakeholders to be involved in this project so that as we move ahead, they are part and parcel of it so that we can sustain the project and keep it off from politics and other kind of whatever. Thank you. Hope I've answered your question. Can, yes. I, can I just follow up? I think the um, what you're talking about, the historical documentation, would be a really powerful agent of communication, you know, with um, with all of us as, as to the project, and also um, a tool for um, use in in other um, a similar situations. So I I, yeah. I hope that rolls out as as you wish it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Larissa. Right. So I don't know what happened to Jane. Um, Jane, if you do want to raise your hand again, we can come back to you. But there are a couple of other questions that have come up in the chat, David. Um, this one's from Jürgen. Um, he asks if you could tell us a little bit more about the invasive shrub, which was the cestrum, um, mm. that that's in the degraded um, area. Um, maybe you could let us know if you know anything of the origins of it and and I'm just adding to actually just adding to Jürgen's question. Sorry, Jürgen, I'm hijacking your question here, but I'm keen to know. Um, it's it's invasive, so it, it's not just um, non-native or alien, as we call it in South Africa. It's it's is it actually an invasive? So if left unchecked, does it actually you know invade the space of other um, indigenous trees? Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Um... I'll talk about two invasive, invasive species. There are like a number of them, but I want to talk about the key two invasive species. In the forest of Cabolet, we have um, the cestrum, which is a small flowery plant. Maybe you can search for it. Cestrum is with a C-E-N-T-R-U-M. So that tree, I don't know, the origin I think is somewhere in Mexico or something, but uh, I don't know how it came into Kenya. I've not read about the history. But what I know is that um, it ensures, it frustrates any undergrowth below it. Even if you plant a tree and um, system is there, it will not grow because it completely protects its territory. And um, I think that can be among the main reasons why we have not had a natural regeneration in that particular area. And uh, the best way to deal with it is to do uh, a ma manual removal. Thus, uh, we uproot it and uh, maybe convert it into something else. I could say we ban, but I feel like if we've got technology, people who have some technology, we can see if we can use this particular universal species to make things like uh, what we call um, briquettes, or find a way of making it useful um, to the environment and to people as well. So that's what I can talk about. I don't know what I can talk about. Uh, you are satisfied with the answer. And number two, we have in Sewa Swam National Park, among the greatest threats to Sewa National Park. And uh, that's among the key reasons which inspired me to go back and see how we can protect the park is we have a species called elephant grass. Uh, it found its way from people's farms into the park and uh, due to eutrophication, due to, of course, there's a lot of silt deposited in the park because there's no protection from external variants. 
So during flooding, uh, all the fertile soils with chemical fertilizers, they find their way into the park. So this tree found, uh, this species found its way into the park and it grows so wild because it has found a um, good fertile environment where it can cherish. And while there, it's frustrating all other uh, plants and animals in the swamp, uh, taking away the vegetation that is needed by the Satunga to survive. And um, for that, you can see that the, the, the population of the Satunga in that particular park has really dwindled. The population has come really down in that park. And uh, you remember that this park was created in the 70s, specifically to protect that species. So our park is really threatened. So uh, the, uh, uh, the only way we are using it, I mean, the park is using to remove that particular species is by manual removal again, because you can't use chemicals in that particular uh, sensitive ecosystem. Thank you. I don't That's know whether good. I've answered your question. Yes. No, I, I think I, well, I think you have. I hope you have. Um, that's uh, thank you for sharing that. And and also, I I did note that you mentioned in the presentation that you also have an issue with eucalyptus, which is a big yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, issue you, here we, in South Africa too. And of course, they they're absolute water guzzlers. <laughs> so mm. um, yeah, that's something maybe you're going to look. And there's a lot of secondary or byproducts that one can make with with eucalyptus wood, of course. Um, actually, actually, we are introducing bamboo to replace the eucalyptus because even though bamboo is not uh, native to this area but it, we have the african bamboo which is native yes but we believe that uh, even the, uh, the, the, you know, the i mean non indigenous bamboo that we bring in it's still good for the environment it grows so fast and it can still meet the timber and wooden products or wooden uh, wood demand right. as uh, which can replace the eucalyptus as well as uh, conserve the ecology of the wetlands. That's, that's really good to hear. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to bring Jane in to the conversation. Yeah, um, uh, my name is Jane Wigis for Frasier. I'm a board member at the EOC. And um, I'm just, uh, first of all, I want to thank David for the nice presentation and his team for working so hard on the is the Tunga Kitale Tunga Camp and uh, the work that they're doing here it's amazing. Uh, I introduced ERC to David um, some time back because I saw the kind of work he's doing here and there in Kitale town and I said um, I, I admire your work in that maybe you can join our ERC community and he said yeah so I sent him the the website and he looked at it and he said yeah I think this is this is something I could want to uh, part of it and uh, that I guided him to apply and stuff like that and uh, and he started the he got in and um, I like the work the work is resilient he's so pushy when it comes to um, working with the communities into the environment things and so passionate about it and the team are all the same very hard-working people and once the community understand that they can't ruin their own ecosystems um, they they try to now uh, 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 go towards helping to restore it, and which is something that I've really loved about this project. The community are into wanting to help restore and not to destroy the trees that they plant. They care for them, for the trees to grow, and it's something that is very amazing. So I um, just wanted not to ask a question because I love what they're doing already. I just want to appeal to any, everybody who is here that this is a very good project. This ecosystem is very important because we lost a lot of um, uh, species of animals like the Statunga itself, and which gives the name to the area where the ecosystem is. And we really would love to see the ecosystem restored and the Statungas coming back and the, the crane, cranes coming back and all other, the, the monkeys and everything, all the ecosystem and have a lot of biodiversity. So I just want to appeal to all those who are here today and those others who will join this later and listen to us to really come in and support these projects. It's, it's very important to this ecosystem. And otherwise, thank you so much for everyone for coming in to listen to Vitale staff. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jen. Uh, actually, uh, you have been an inspiration and uh, we love you. You are a good person. Thank you for introducing me to ERC and uh, 
for appreciating our kind of work. Asante san. Jane, yes, um, I must apologize. It was very miss of me. I, did, I didn't actually um, introduce you to the audience. You're so famous. I just assume everyone knows you. So <laughs> Jane, Jane Magisa <laughs> Fraser is, is not only a supervisory board member for Ecosystem Restoration Community, she's also incredibly active and impactful in the ecosystem restoration space across Africa and probably further afield. Um, and we're really happy to have you here tonight and that you brought such an awesome um new partner into the restoration community movement so thank you so much um brian there's a question from thanks jane um there's a question from brian hamill it's been waiting for a while and and it's an it's a really interesting one so i'd like to um put that one to you next I, sorry everyone i am acutely aware that we're running a bit over schedule i'm not sure how many more questions there are but i i do want to get this one in before we before we close so Brian asks, are there any plans uh, to plant very high value native trees and lumber trees? So I think you have um, answered the part about the, the, the lumber trees already. You've spoken about the um, bamboo that's indigenous to, to Africa that you're using to replace eucalyptus. But um, maybe you could speak to the planting of the high value native fruit trees um combined with the lumber so that there's a constant food resource and good economic return for for the for the current community but obviously looking ahead to future future generations just to comment on that uh, when uh, i began this project last year uh, the county government of tanzoya after giving me the trainers at supply i mean the, the, like the tools they also came down and they asked me what I wanted and uh, I told them we need to support the livelihood of these communities so that um, they can be sustainable, our initiative can be sustainable. And sure enough, we tried out a few avocados and we gave to the communities and they planted and the bamboos. And um, so far so good, those trees are doing well. Uh, my vision for the future for this community is uh, to completely support them with uh, livelihood support programs. Like I look into it like like the bamboo we give them, we can come up with the uh, cottage industries whereby we train them on the use of bamboo because it's a new crop and uh, how it can be processed so that they can get uh, the, the benefits they get from eucalyptus. They get it from this bamboo. Or we plant, give them avocados, uh, many avocados. They grow them from like circles and uh, maybe if, if possible, we get like an industry to process avocado products and um, sell the products in the market or export the avocado to where we have good market for them. So we have all these kind of ideas where we can support the, the community or do fish farms and the ponds in their homes so that they have supply of water and uh, uh, an extra benefit of fish to supplement on their nutrition. So. Uh, we have all these kind of projects that we need to look into yeah, in the future so that we can make the place sustainable. Sorry for talking too much. Maybe <laughs> let me take more questions. <laughs> no, not at all. That's um, it's really interesting information, and it's it's good to see that you're looking at that sort of as, as a succession plan, um, not mm. just currently on the restoration, but looking beyond and, that and looking and at. And actually, the we also have the carbon markets. Maybe um, we are not experts in carbon market, but it's a field. We could have wished to look into if we can develop a plan or a program to support communities and carbon uh, uh, benefits from their trees to help them keep the trees sustainable. That can be great also. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, there is a lot of conversation happening in the chat. I'm not necessarily going to bring it all in, into this conversation, but um, there are a lot of people recommending some interesting uh, approaches that you can try and wanting to connect you with various people, including Chan from um, ERC Doku in Borneo. Um, I know Chan is doing a lot of work with planting bamboo. It's probably a different species, but I'm sure that there's a lot of common ground there that you'd, you'd have. Um, and we'll make all those connections um, after this call. Um, just before I, I, I close and, and thank David again, um, are there any last burning questions that anyone would like to to put to him live? Obviously, you can you can also reach um, David via his uh, the, the page the the City of Kitali page on the ERC website, or you can pop a mail to 
hello, hello at erc.earth. Once again, super simple to remember. Um, Melissa can maybe just pop that email address in case you didn't catch it because of my weird accent um, in the chat. But um, and we'll forward any comms with gladly onto to David and um, and his team to to yeah to to answer. Um, but any last any last questions from anyone? Um, uh, hello, I, I just made a comment already in the chat, uh, and uh, thank you very much, David, for your great presentation and inspiring project. I just wanted to make a point that your Cestrum problem looked very much similar to what they had in New Zealand on degraded forests that was a uh, gorse in, uh, 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 spreading everywhere. And whatever they tried to eradicate, uh, it came back with a vengeance until one restorer figured out it's a succession plant and red eradication is always resetting the succession to, to zero and they have to start again. So he started with small planting, planting of trees in small islands and they shaded out the plant uh, and killed gores automatically as the, as the entire succession continued. I have uh, shared the link of the film Fools and Dreamers uh, in, the, in the chat. Have a look. Maybe it's not your case, but maybe it's something similar. I found it very, very striking to see your, your images. Thank you very much. And good luck with your fascinating project. I really enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jürgen. <laughs> I'll check and yeah. Great. John, any any final thoughts you'd like to add? Or? Well, I, I was just thinking, you know, when we're talking about vetiver grasses, we're talking about bamboo, we're talking about natural natural things and restoration. I think we also need to think about the beautiful cultural crafts that come out of Africa. I, I don't know if you've been to Whole Whole Foods or something in the United States recently, but if you want to buy a basket from West Africa, it's going to cost you $65 or $75 mm -hmm. or something. Like that. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but look at what we're facing with microplastics everywhere, with all these plastic things degrading into, into tiny molecules and, and, and spreading around the world. It's, it's terribly poisonous. And it, it, the, the, you know, we, we, we need to stop that. We need to have natural things to carry our groceries home in, you know, it's, it's ridiculous now. So I think that when we realize that this has, this has a p potential to create certainly income and but not just income but to transform our societies and our civilization into one which is healthy and natural so i i, I think you're doing a, a lot of wonderful things and carry on and whatever whatever we can do to help let us know and um, let's try to have have a global response because you know, we need you to lead and we need others to help you. And then we need to multiply this effort by millions and billions of people. So thank you again. And if anybody really wants to talk for a while, I'm, I'm still awake. So um, we can, we can maybe stop the and just go to general discussion if if you want to, but feel okay. free anybody who wants to stay for a little while. Thank you, John. Um, I will um, just first um, officially end our fireside chat. David, thank you again. <laughs> um, really okay, you're welcome. For your mm. um, and and thank you, Isabel, for your hand in in the presentation as well. And thank you to your filmmaker. He's um, he's a real storyteller. And thanks, Isabel. <laughs> Everyone who's joined us, thank you for the questions that you've shared. Thank you for all the, the loads of information and, and um, gems of advice that you've shared. We'll make sure that um, when I download the recording that David, that all those get to David um, and his team. Um, thank you, John, for being here. I'm going to end the recording now, but those that would like to stay on for an informal conversation um, with John are, are welcome to. Um, I wish you all a, a brilliant uh, uh, morning, afternoon, evening, 
ahead. We look forward to connecting with you again next month. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us and go well.